Dr. Linda Seeger. It is an immense pleasure to welcome you virtually to Yale. Uh, we have a huge number of fans in the room, and uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, they've also sent in uh, a number of questions uh, that they, they want to ask you. So, um, but you, you wanted to sort of address us uh, initially, and we, we look forward to that. Obviously, what's much on our minds is how the industry has changed uh, from, from the writer's perspective over the last 20 years, and also where all of this um, wonderful new technology, um, uh, artificial intelligence, and, and where all of that is, is taking us. So kind of, if you could also, as part of your sort of talk, sort of um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, sort of crystal balling the, the future. These, these guys are all interesting, entry, entering the industry at a very interesting time. We just discussed that about the status of blockbuster funds changing and long grinding to a halt. And um, but there, there, there's concern in the room about you know they are possibly training to be in an industry as screenwriters or directors or producers or actors or whatever. And because of the technological changes, what they're training for might not be there or at least in its present incarnation in three, four, five years time. So this is this is kind of what's on our, what's on their minds. If you could maybe talk about that, we would really appreciate it. Well. Um... First of all, I'm not a technological expert or futurist. So a story is a story. And it doesn't matter if you're doing it for video, um, you know, digital, or a video game, or a movie, or a series. Um, you're still using the same ideas that that writing is an art, a craft, and a creative process. So one of the things you're thinking is, what's my unique voice? Well, who am I? How, who am I as an, audi uh, as an artist? And one really great question to ask is, if you were a genre, what genre would you be? <laughs> So now I would be a musical comedy genre. Um, <laughs> yes. I am known to break into song and to know the lyrics to <laughs> just about every um, musical from the 50s and 60s, and then don't count on it from much later than that. <laughs> but it's a good way to say what attracts you is what is an artist. You're, you're not thinking about commercial. You're saying, who am I? Um, what kind of characters attract me? What values attract me? Um, am I quirky? Am I dramatic? Am I funny? Am, if I'm funny, am I farcical? Or am I sort of a very human drum comedy kind of thing? You know, one of my favorite comedies is Tootsie, which has such heart. In fact, I love comedies that have heart in them. And so that's the artistic side of you. And it might take a while to find your voice. So that means you write quite a lot. And eventually you find yourself writing in one way versus another way. You, it, you begin to discover it and you have to do quite a bit of writing to find out what that artistic voice is. And sometimes you have to listen to other people and sometimes you have to not listen to other people who are trying to put you in your box. So, so writing as an art with a unique voice and look at, if you're interested in TV or movies, look at where the unique voice is. Um, you know, the Coen brothers have a very specific voice and there's sort of black comedy and dark comedy. And so if you lean toward that, study the people that are in that area, in that arena and say, this is the kind of thing that I am drawn to and that I like, so let me play around with it. Then secondly is writing as a craft. So when we talk about the three act structure or dimensional characters, or how do you visualize your thematic idea that you're working with or what is your theme? How are you communicating it without being a, a message? So you learn the craft of writing and sometimes you focus more on the craft and sometimes you focus more on the art, but eventually the two of them have to come together. 
right. then thirdly, you have to learn what your creative process is. Right. So what you do is you're thinking about, I'll just tell you how I see the creative process is preparation, incubation, illumination, the moment that you get the aha, and verification when other people say the comedy you wrote is actually funny. Then you know that you are getting verification and an evaluation that says what you set out to do of writing a good script, actually you achieved. And remember that you know writing is a communication. It's both expression and communication. So you're working on the, you know, on the two of those. And it doesn't matter what the form, it's all of these things are relative, whatever the form. And uh, it is true, things change, but if you turn on the TV and stream, looks to me like a story, you know? Well, it doesn't matter what I'm watching, whether it was made 20 years ago or whether it's the newest thing on the block, it's still a story. And it's true, sometimes character is going to supersede the story a bit. Sometimes the story is going to be very strong, which you hope is true in a mystery or an action adventure. Um, espionage, you better have the clues to follow. And um, so you're, you're working with all this. It's just that the forms are different. And uh, so you study the form as you say, what's, what do I, um, where do I fit in all of this? And that means you're watching a lot of different kinds of things that on television and in the movies and you're making notes. You're, you're always a sponge. That's one of the things a writer is, is a, a writer just soaks it up and brings it in and notices and keeps noticing, but you don't write for the commercial market. You learn what it means to communicate. And um, so in that sense, you're writing to say, I want it to be commercial. I'm not writing for one person or it satisfies me, but no one else, but that's fine. It obviously is not fine in this art form, but you are being aware of what is out there and where do you fit within the scheme of things? And that means a lot of experimentation and exploration. So you might have to try out a lot of things. Don't be afraid. A writer writes. Don't be afraid to write. As you write and you write some more and you write some more and you write lots of drafts of what you write. I, um, when I work on a book, and of course all my books are nonfiction, that's in a sense my art form is nonfiction writing, that I figure I'm gonna write 10 drafts before it's ready to be published. And um, that's just what writers do, is you, you keep at it. You don't think your first draft is ready to go and you keep learning and you keep being open. Yeah. So, and then the publisher makes you do another drop, 10 drops. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have editors and you might go to a script consultant or you might be in a writer's group or a class like this and you get feedback and then you write some more and then you get more feedback. And at some point you feel like you've set out what you set out to do is you've done. Right. Uh, Linda, can you please talk about the, the research process? Well, yeah. the thing is, when people say, write what you know about, mm -hmm. the reason they say that is if you don't know about it, you're going to spend an awful lot of time researching. Now, there's nothing wrong if you get, um, you know, let's say you get an assignment um, and you have to go to Africa, make sure you're there long enough to, to, uh, learn what you have to know, but it's better to write what you know about than have to start all over. For instance, um, I was teaching a class uh, some years ago and I asked what people were working on. This one woman said she was working on a safari, a film about a safari in Africa. And I said, 
have you been on a safari? And she said, no. And I said, have you been to Africa? And she said, no. Now, there's something wrong with this picture. <laughs> so, um, and the because the details and the nuances are very different from one area to the next. Um, for instance, I grew up in a town of 2,500 people, Peshtigo, Wisconsin, North, Northern Wisconsin. I know a lot about small towns. And if I read a script about a small town and I see something that's kind of off, I can say somebody has not spent time in a small town. Um, um, my husband and I are rewatching Northern Exposure at the moment, and it's a small town. And so far, it feels like a small town. It feels like somebody knows what they're talking about. And having been to Alaska once, I can say, well, the little I know about Alaska it feels right. So it's important. Now, the research can be done through interviews. Um, I mean, I think you need to be there. I think that's one thing to soak it in and to notice all the details, but you also wanna usually do interviews. You can do book research, depending if you're doing something historical, you're gonna do a lot of material and research on that particular period of history. Right. So, but you're supposed to be the expert and I can tell the difference when I was working on scripts, I've been retired a few years, but um, I could tell the difference because something was fresh. I remember reading a um, script about the Yukon and I found out that you can actually take the tundra, you know, the um, off, you can cut into it and take it off and make it like a blanket and you can actually slip in underneath it. Now, there might be a lot of flies and insects, so I wouldn't recommend you'd want to do that much. But the way the guy described the tundra, I was quite sure he'd been there. And he said, well, I worked on, uh, the, with, for an oil company for three years. I could tell because I learned something new. And so what you want to do is to become an expert on that area that you are writing about because it's the details and the nuances that make it fresh, mm. as opposed to you should know more than I know as a watcher, if you're writing about it, um, think of the nuances and all the details. Right. Uh, well, what is your take on the, the status quo in the industry? We've got these huge battles between the, the legacy studios and the streamers, um, you know, cinema attendance is down, there's something certainly happening with, you know, all of these blockbusters from, uh, you know, the DC ones and Batman this and and the Star Trek, Star Wars. There's not as many of those being greenlit as there was. Is this a great time is to get into the industry for, for, for these guys here? Is it is in any way comparable to perhaps, you know, the new Hollywood and where we had, uh, you know, Dennis Hopper and, and, uh, and uh, you know, all, all these kind of, uh, creative, but also box of a successful movies coming out, which are creatively, artistically more interesting. Is can we compare, you know, Easy Rider, or can, can we compare other parallels to be drawn between that period and what we're going through right now? Because there's so much convulsion with, with within the, the 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 filmmaking community. Well, there's so many possibilities. Um, first of all, there's so many competitions, for instance, both screenwriting competitions and when you do the movie film uh, art festivals and getting the film into these various, um, well, you know, various art festivals and comp art film competitions. So I have, um, I have clients that obviously have done the work, uh, one of them, from Mexico City says he's entered his film in 30 different of these um, festivals. And he said it's been accepted in 17 and in something like five or seven, it was the premier, uh, you know, first night film. So one of the things though to do 
it would be good for you to write three to five scripts in the genre that is of interest to you and enter into competitions and really be prepared. And then if you're going to compete in the Hollywood market, you're going to have to go to Los Angeles. So save your money, rent is high. But mm -hmm. you want, um, and when you go to Los Angeles, you, you're gonna meet a lot of people. Now that doesn't mean, mean that everyone you meet, you try to say, what can you do for me? Uh, don't be a taker. You want to be known as a giver, not a taker. But you meet people and you join organizations. I was part of Women in Film when I started script consulting. And 85% of my business at the beginning came from Women in Film. They were either Women in Film members or they were Women in Film referrals. But there's a lot of organizations now, some of them you can't join right away. Uh, the Motion Picture Academy and the TV Academy. TV Academy is a little easier to get into. And I was a member of that, but I was not qualified. As someone said, it doesn't matter who recommended you. You just, uh, there was no area in motion pictures for script consultants. So, um, but there's there are things like, radio and television there's organizations like women in film which men can join now and which have meetings and you can meet people so one of the things you want to do is to meet a lot of people and to get get some feeling of the insider what what you know what's the uniform i um there was a guy that came from michigan that i knew and he was going off for interviews wearing a three-piece suit. That's not what you wear to interviews in Hollywood. Um, it doesn't mean you wear your jeans with the holes in, um, but uh, some I, I know some people that dress a little bit like what kind of genre. So uh, one of my friends, Sharon, who did has done relatively well in this area, um, she said, if I'm going to meet, because I'm doing an action adventure and meet with the producer who has done like lethal weapon kind, she said, I might be wearing my black leather jacket. I want to look like somebody that knows what I'm talking about while still being aware of the uniform. And one might say, does it matter? I would say, yes, you want to be an insider, not an outsider. And so you pay attention to everything and you pay attention to um, you, again, you're a sponge, you're learning about the marketing and you're learning what area, but you can do low budget films and get those into festivals. And uh, I mean, I've had clients that have done films for $7,000 that were actually pretty good and got into festivals and won some awards. So you want to be aware of all these different pipelines. There's um, your, and there's opportunities to meet people in the business. Sometimes they come and they speak at some of these organizations. So you're, you're trying to learn as much as you can. And you're also trying not to be arrogant. One of the things that happens in Hollywood, people get incredibly egocentric and it gets very wearing very quickly to people who are in the business and have to listen to somebody bragging about the three scripts that they wrote, especially mm -hmm. when that person has written 22. <laughs> so um, be just a little aware of you're again you're a sponge and you can learn from so many people in the business and a lot of people in the business are very generous they are willing to help out and um, give someone a break if they can and sometimes you break in by working at a studio or a production company or a network and maybe you start out in the mail room or you start out as a secretary is um, hone your typing skills you you need your you need the skills for entry level things to get your foot in the door 
and you never know what that might be. No. Um, my it's foot in the door went in because I was a fast typist and I started getting the toe in the door. Then there used to be that um, one of the best ways of breaking in the industry was as a writer was to write a couple of really good independent, fairly low budget movies and get those made, uh, get, you know, critical reviews and have them make a certain amount of money and sort of escalate your career from there. Others were, would say, well, no, I, I want to get straight into the studio business and they would write much bigger movies in, with a, in the hope that to engender a, a script sale down the road and, and get straight into the studio machine. How how are things changed? Is, is this the um, still a way to go or go straight to the studio? No, no. First of all is you're probably not going to get in the studio system anyway. Yeah. So look for production companies or form your own. And yes, write some scripts. If you're interested in television, write some spec scripts for a series that is similar to the one you want to break into. Don't write for the series you want to break into because they know the series better and they'll see all the problems in your script of things you don't know about. But just think about what's the what's a similar genre that I can show my ability at writing and have three or five scripts. And, um, I had years ago when Cagney and Lacey was on television, mm -hmm. I had a um, I had somebody write a script for Cagney and Lacey and I happened to know one of the producers of that series. And so I managed to help Lynn get her script into Cagney and Lacey. And the producer said, we thought it was a really pretty good script and that she did really good with the character of Cagney, but not as much with the character of Lacey. So I told my client, if I were you, Starting tomorrow morning, I would sit down and write another Cagney and Lacey, and I would study, you know, the character they're saying you're not doing well. And you now have a little bit of a pipeline. You have a toe in the door because this producer has just said she thought you were pretty talented. So you start using that. You know what this writer did? Didn't do a thing didn't take the opportunity. And the thing is, whenever a door opens a crack, you walk through it. And even if it doesn't seem exactly like where you want to get to, walk through it anyway. And I have seen so many writers sabotage their careers. They had an opportunity and they didn't take it and they got arrogant. I, I had a writer one time, he had written um, he had written a movie about a famous boxer, and I know a little about boxing, but I knew the name of this. Let's let's just it wasn't Muhammad Ali, but let's just pretend it was Muhammad Ali. So I thought he was a pretty good script, and I gave him the notes, and he kept responding to me like there was like I was kind of nuts. I was being very encouraging of him. And he finally confessed, he said, I went to another script consultant who tore my script down one way and tore it down the other way and had nothing but negative things. And I said, well, it needs a rewrite. But I said, this is some good stuff. You've really captured this. So he wants to have a movie made, a feature film, and he gets an uh, interest from HBO. And I said, take the deal. This is a perfect HBO movie. And he says, well, I want to get a movie made. I want a feature film. Why can't I get a feature film? And Linda, it gets, if, we were, if we were to talk about that writing, guess, yeah, committing writing a suicide, uh, self-destructive careers, we, we could, because I used to be yes. a manager, we could, and it's beyond me, why? And then so many of them ended up painting houses and selling shoes in Santa Monica as a result. And uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a huge enigma to me. I, I, don't, I don't really understand it. Yes. So mm -hmm. don't kill your career before it got started. I begged this guy. I said, mm -hmm. I will get down to my hands and knees if necessary. I beg you to take the deal. 
by the time he went back to HBO, they were no longer interested. Why is that person so, doing now? Uh, nothing's ever happened. I don't think anything's happened in that person's career. So, so you see painting houses is a usual euphemism. Yeah, those are golden words, by the way. Absolutely. Any door that opens for you in the industry, take it because you never, if it's a secretary door, if it's mail room, whatever, you never know where it's going to lead. You never know who else is in that room. Uh, so, and I, I make plenty of those mistakes myself, by the way. So, um, learning the hard way, but I, I, I totally agree with you there. Okay. Linda, um, I have a, we have a lot of questions um, from the students. So if I could um, ask them to, to, to do, direct you, address you directly with their questions. Um, Jason, your, your second question, you have it in front of you? Yes. Uh, Dr. Sager, what advice would you give to budding screenwriters when faced with rejection or other impediments in their careers? Oh yeah, rejection, get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't take it personally, even when it's meant to be personal, is you're gonna get loads of rejections. And um I think Lawrence Kasdan got uh 60 rejections, you know, he did the bodyguard huge hit. And um I think he did one of the Raiders of the Lost Arts, it might have been the first one. Uh, Silverado, I mean, a huge career. And he said he got turned down 60 times before something happened. So um, what you do is just, uh, you, you have to be tough skinned enough that, you know, you just say, I'm gonna get rejections. And when they say, your script is very good, but we're not going in that direction. That does not mean your script is very good. It's like nobody wants to burn any bridges and that includes the executives and the producers. They don't wanna burn a bridge in you by telling you you're terrible and then you have the next hit. So, um, so they always are very nice about it. That most of the time, the rejections are going to be very nice and they don't mean much, that you have no idea what it means. Does it mean that your script is good or not? You don't really know. Ladies so, and uh, talking about uh, rejections and dealing with rejections and people who issue rejections, what is your take on working in a positive way with people who have development in their title? Oh, yeah. Well, you're usually not going to work with development executives unless they're interested in your script and you make a sale with them. And then you'll have some meetings and they might be strong in one way or another. For instance, you might have a um, development executive you work with who's good at story, but not good at character. And so just because you're working with a development executive doesn't mean your script is gonna become great. Now, having been a script consultant for almost 40 years, I believe strongly in going to script consultants because a script consultant is supposed to be good at the craft of writing and is supposed to make your script a better crafted piece of work and is supposed to encourage your creativity and your art side. So um, you don't wanna go to the script consultant and say, this is the worst thing I ever worked on. Yours, or uh, Will Akers has a book out called Your Script Sucks. I don't know why he titled this book. I like Will a lot, but I think it's a terrible title. <laughs> and um, when my book, a friend who gave me the title for my book, Making a Good Script Great, is it's a much more positive oh, yeah. look yeah, you know, at scripts. Yeah. So um, you want to get feedback and you want to give feedback that is really useful to you. You're going to go through that process. And at some point, if you do get backing from a production company or studio, then you're gonna be working and swerving that script according to their needs. Right, okay. So um, we just watched, or most of our cases, we watched Witness a few days ago. Uh, yeah. which is obviously a great movie and you, you've written about it extensively in your in your books um so bearing in mind witness um diego could we ask you to read the first question do you have your questions in front yes, of you yes. um dr sager 
In your book, Making a Good Screenplay Tree, you emphasize the importance of subplots for creating a good story and how often the writer focused in the subplot rather than the main plot. In such a case, why do you think writers don't turn the subplot into the actual plot? I always want to decide whether a subplot shouldn't turn into the main plot or vice versa. Well, the subplot is usually going to be smaller than this than what I call the A storyline. The A storyline in a mystery, it's the mystery, and the subplot is the probably the love story or the relationship of the son and the father, or a more relational kind of story. In most cases, um, there's always exception, in most cases, the biggest thing is the through line of the story. Now, let's just, if I can go back to Tootsie, which we rewatched this week. Um, in Tootsie, though, the A story is about somebody being in a soap opera. But the, that whole movie is filled with subplots. And the subplots of all these different relationships that Michael has with his roommate and with Sandy and with Julie and with the father who wants to marry Dorothy. And I mean, all of these, it's laden with subplots, but you never lose that through line. And you might say in Witness, you're, the second act is really focusing on the subplot um, between John Book and between the Amish woman and, and, and the Amish, you know, as a community. And so, but you never lose the fact there's a mystery going on, that there's been a murder. Um, so it drops down it's, it's like a little melody in the second act, but it's not the main melody in the second act, but you can't lose it. You can't lose that storyline. So now some people, I worked with a famous writer one time. I, I heard she had done a really big hit. She was working on a sequel and she was so interested in the subplot, she would not deal with the A story and the problem was the A story was getting lost all the time. She didn't want to hear it. She didn't want me to talk about the A story. She only wanted to talk about the subplots. But the problem was not the subplots. The subplots were perfectly fine. The problem was her A story. So, so you're always, you're balancing it. And you pretty much need subplots for dimensionality because a, a script should be relational and you know deal with relationships between people. There are very few successful movies that are about one person. Um, movies tend to be relational and it's very difficult to make a movie that will carry through with one person. All right, thank you. Um, Francesca? Yeah, great. Um, Dr. Sager, thank you so much for sharing your incredible wisdom and time with us and writing this little mini Bible. Thank you. Um, so it, now in the world that we live in that is so much about streaming um, and so much about much bigger works, I, I wonder how do you break down structure in longer works now that are episodic? Mm -hmm. You know, Succession, The Bear, whatever, you know, you're, they're, they're huge, long narratives, but how do you deal with the episode? How do you make structure? Yeah, well, I have worked. I have worked on some of these long forms. Um, I was the script consultant on the Tunnel, which was originally the Scandinavian Danish uh, series, and then got picked up by Mexico and the United States, and then got picked up by, um, and then uh, uh, actually the Bridge, the Bridge, and then got picked up by France and England and became the tunnel. So one of the things I do is I take the whole series. So that one I think was 10 episodes. So I wanna see my first turning point probably at the end of episode two and my last turning point somewhere in episode nine. And I wanna see a midpoint, which is gonna help structure and round this more. So that would be probably the end of episode five. 
So I'm going to look at, first of all, the whole series and see if that can be structured. Um, then I'm going to look at each episode and structure that in the three act ex, um, in the three act structure as well. And I'm going to break down the storyline and the subplots to see, you know, a subplot might not come in until episode two or three. So I want to make sure the subplot though is structured. So I'm breaking this thing down every which way you can think of. And I remember on the bridge, some of what I got were treatments. And um, I think I got the first episode that was written and then most of the rest was treatments and I followed every clue. So I'm making sure all the threads are gonna add up all the way through and that nothing is getting lost. So in a series, I don't want a character to disappear for three hours. I want to thread that character in. And, and uh, sometimes what I used to do, part of my method was to color code. I would write down all the plot points of which there might be three pages worth of what are people doing? What's the events that make up the story? And then I color code them, which is the A story, purple, okay. What's the love story? Okay, pink for the love story and yellow for another part of the story and green for another. So I had all these magic markers, but I could look at it and say, oh, the green disappeared for two episodes. We got a thread in more green. And the writer was able to see with the color coding and, and you, I give you permission if you wanna do that, I'm not in business anymore, but the um, these, color coding helped the writer as well see where are where is something dropping out because what you're doing is you are threading and you're threading the storyline and you're threading the subplots so you want to keep them going and you want to make sure in one way or another some way to analyze and assess and make it objective and one of the reasons i use this particular method and that's what I became known for at the beginning. Later, I, I didn't use that method on every script that I was working on, but I wanted to find a way to make the script objective enough that the writer could see and we could talk about it without defenses going up and be in agreement. Yes, the red, yes, that is the storyline. Yes, the pink, yes, that is the love subplot. We can agree on that. So I always work toward agreement when I was working with the writer and you as a writer can do something like this because it gives you a handle on making this objective enough that you know what is missing and what needs to be expanded on and what's not needed. You know, if you say, well, I only have one purple, you might want to drop that and say, I either got to thread it or I got to get rid of it. Because Dr. Ray, really great answer, Belinda. Thank you very much. Follow the road. Mm. Um, Ella Grace, there you are. Your second one, please. Um, so, my question is what are some ways in which a writer can clearly set up an antagonist as being the protagonist in her voice or like in herself? And what are the elements you would suggest to bring out this inner conflict to the screen so it's not just like an internal emotion? Yeah, well, um, you are right about that what is going on inside needs to have a way to be visualized outside for a film. And so one of the things to think about is gesture and action that people take. I mean, if you know people who are antagonistic, what do they say and what do they do? And so you, you're gonna study, um, you wanna do a bit of study of people who are like this other person you're writing about and don't just go and watch movies with strong antagonists. Look at life, look at people, look at how, how people who are antagonistic force and create, uh, we could say create chaos and create 
bad feelings and resist. And it's, um, there are people in this world who, and one of the things that you might do just for one day, and you, you're going to think about it rather than actually do it, you could go through the day and think of all the different opportunities you had during that day to be antagonistic. So you go to the cleaners and there's a spot still on your clothes and you pick a fight with the cleaning lady, you know, the person at the dry cleaners. And you go and you find you want to buy bananas and there's some bananas that look don't look very good so you complain to the grocer and you um, you're in a relationship with somebody and you don't like the way they did the hair their hair today and so you pick a fight or with why do you have to wear that color green it doesn't become you and so just you're practicing conflict because what happens is that we, um, as we mature, we learn to diffuse conflict. We learn to lower the temperature as mature people. And so you start to be a writer and now you have to raise the temperature and it goes against all the psychological work and all the therapy that you've done in order to diffuse conflict. And now you're supposed to be aware of it. So. Um, and you can look at people and sometimes you can find out what's people who create conflict is what is really going on in their heads. What in a lot of times it's jealousy and a lot of times it's, uh, well, I mean, I probably most of the time is jealousy and envy that's going on, especially if they're picking a fight with you. Um, I've seen some interesting examples of, um, of you know, conflict. Just um, I'm, I'm writing my memoirs right now, and I've been writing the chapter about a conflict I had with a colleague. And she saw me as a mentor, and she had to find some way to get me off my pedestal that she had created in order to find her own identity. And so she she did something really bad to me and very offensive. I mean, a huge disrespectful insult. And um, I said, I said to myself, something is going on here. I never asked to be her mentor. I'm glad to help. I obviously was. I just didn't know I I didn't know I was. And um, so but I have over the years sort of figured out what was going on underneath the surface. So one of the things to do is train yourself in understanding subtext, what's really going on, as opposed to what people are saying is going on. And I, I have a whole book on subtext and I have a whole book on dialogue. And you might wanna read those two books to help you. Again, you practice subtext and you practice learning about it because as we mature, we do text. We try not to be deceptive. We not try not to do things underhanded. And then you're a writer and now you have to know about subtext and underhanded deceptive things. So being a good writer, um, you're, you're balancing. You wanna be a good person and you wanna be a good writer and you're balancing these two things and don't let the writer conflict, bad stuff take you over. Um, you can still be a good person and write terrible about terrible people. <laughs> yes. That, that this might come down to the research factor, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. People and you take too much, too much of it home, but that's another story I'll be going to. Truman, number one. <laughs> yes, um, let's see. With um, uh, um, let's see here. With so much content out there, it see it seems really difficult at times to like execute an idea. That, um, that an idea like that's better than something that's already been done. It's even harder to create something that you might that you might be confident in saying is something original, and rather than being derived from this and that, um, as just a terrible stitching together of things you've already seen. So how do you like, how do you um, distinguish like, in, inspiration from simple imitation of, of something whenever you're researching or journaling? Um, 
Well, you're looking for the truth. I mean, I always think writing is about getting at the truth. And I think sometimes you have to sit down with yourself and ask, did I, was I truthful? I remember one time I got a bad review of one of my books and I called my career consultant to consult me. And she said, did you tell the truth? And I said, I did. And she said, well, then don't worry about it. And there are times when I write and I say, I just haven't gone deep enough. I've, um, I've skirted the surface and I just have to sit down with myself and say, what can I say that hasn't been said before? And I think a, a lot of it is that ability to sit down and to be quiet, to be centered and to be able to just say, what have I done and have I seen this done before? And what am I trying to get in? And that's why we write from experience. It doesn't mean everything you write about is a direct experience. It just means you have something to draw on that you've been there in one way or another. And so there are times you simply have to sit down with yourself and say, did I tell the truth? Now, one of the things you can do too, and this is a very constructive way to do with your work, when you write something and you're starting to evaluate, is this, is this good? Don't start with what is not good, start with the good, circle it. I once wrote a chapter actually in my Creating Unforgettable Characters book, I wrote a chapter and when I went to circle what was good, there were three sentences in the whole chapter. And so I sat down and of course I rewrote it. And one of my friends who was giving me feedback, she said, it was, she said the chapter was so good. I, I was reading it at the airport. And I almost missed my airplane. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously I had improved it, but if I circling what is good is you say, where am I getting it right? And what's going on that's really good here? Cause that's where I wanna keep going is in that direction. What did I do that was good? And you can be sure no matter what it is, there are at least three things in that scene or in your script that are worthwhile. And I've worked on all sorts of scripts. I've worked on scripts that were so good. I said, change five things and don't do any more than that. And the person went back, their script got so excited about my, my notes that they changed 20 things and they ruined the script and it never got made. So you have some of that. I had that experience, so Linda, I had that experience working with Iris Yamashita. She got the uh, Academy nomination for Letters from Iwo Jima, and she had to send me the script to consult, and I it, it did the same same thing, basically. I said, look, I could go on and on about the script for the next two days, but in essence, you shouldn't really change much of anything. Just leave it alone. Yeah. It, it's great. If you pull out one brick, you know, out of this thing, it'll probably implode, and the rest is history. She got the Academy nomination she, you know, for the Candice oh. so. So there's a, oh. there's a script and something where less is a lot more, you know, in, in terms yes. of helping them. Uh, okay. Um, what, what an honor. Yes, it was it was great. Um, um, the output at the end of this course for these students is writing a short screenplay. Is there any mm -hmm. advice you give them, you know, because there are considerable differences between writing a full length screenplay, obviously, and a short. Uh, any sort of yes. other wisdom on, on yes. what the is? Yeah, I love short films and I think every short film I worked on got awards. Um, remember the three act structure. I don't care if it's three minutes long, remember the three act structure. Uh, if you haven't seen um, Bambi meets Godzilla, I, I think it's three minutes long, right? You can see a three act structure and Bambi meets Godzilla, which is just such a cute short film. So, um, and take it seriously. I had a, a client, she was talking to me about a short film and she says, well, I'm doing this little short film is called There Is No April. And she says, but I'm really excited about my feature film. And I said, wait a minute, take your short film seriously. 
um, There Is No April was about two women named um, May and June uh, who were sisters and they had a flat tire on the way to Las Vegas to get a quickie divorce. And it, the short film was maybe seven minutes long. And I said, you need to have a three act structure even in this. And so I helped her structure the script and it won um, at the Albany Film Festival, it won audience favorite award. It won several awards and it was just so clean and it was so seamless and it was really quite adorable about, and it had conflict. And so no matter how short the film, you wanna have, um, you wanna pay attention to all these craft things. And I remember another, another client that won, won an award. Um, I think the, I think the, um, it was something like the bellhopper. It was, you know, this sort of interesting little tiny film. And he said, he said, I was the only one that believed in that film. And he said, but I followed the advice and, and it had won several awards as well. So that's your, that's your way in. So don't, don't just think it's just a little short film. It doesn't matter if it's one minute long pay attention to everything that has to do with the crafting of it and your images and try not to be derivative. It's easy to get to be derivative. Don't be thinking about, well, I have to put in a car chase so that Hollywood somehow notices me is to um, uh, be as fresh as you can, find images, think train your mind to be visual. Your uh, screenwriters need to be visual thinkers and you can train your mind to be, to deal with metaphors. I think in advanced screenwriting, I have chapters on um, learning to be visual thinkers and I'm making a good writer great. I also have about various things to do creatively. So, you know, those, most of my books are designed for you to have some, um, you know, whether it's the questions at the end of the chapter or whether it's exercises, but to try to lead you into practicing what it is that I'm talking about in those books. So um, short films are absolutely wonderful. I have enjoyed all the short films that I have worked on and uh, they really are, they're, they're the, a, a good pipeline into the business. Great. Um, Linda, we don't want to take up uh, too much of your time, so I'm just going to open the, the, the floor to see if there's any direct questions to you from the students. All right. So I have a question about, um, this is like very, I guess, sort of pragmatic question about like the industry itself and less about the craft and writing. But when you take that that cracked open door that in and you're working in like a mail room or whatever, um, how do you like a how do you make sure that you're still kind of like working on your writing craft and you're not sort of that um that sort of joke of a character who's like always trying to badger everyone about like, well, I'm working in the mail room right now, but I have this screenplay. Like, how do you make sure you don't get stuck in the mail room and you are still working on like just the craft of the art at the same time. Question. Well, one one thing to do is to really learn from the people you're working with is to observe them. And I think sometimes I see not not immediately, but at some point you might be able to ask somebody a question. Um, don't always think that it's the top person who is going to be the helpful breakthrough person. I have found the best people to get to know our secretaries. And if you're working in the mail room and there's a secretary who is working for the vice president or the director of development or something, um, if you have an opportunity naturally with the vice president or director of development to ask a question and to just, um, and don't ask them to read your script right away, but after six months you might. But you might take the secretary to lunch and say, I really want to know more about how this business works and also 
maybe you can give me some mm -hmm. advice. And um, I, I, the most, I mean, some of the people that have been so helpful to me really have been the bottom of the food chain and not the top. And so, um, but I think asking questions of people and just observing, I used to read when I was a secretary, I used to read memos between the vice, the two vice presidents and because they had a file of them. I wanted to see how people related to each other. I wanted to see what, and I wanted to be aware, how do people dress? What's the professional look on, um, on that? And get to know the other secretaries because you might help each other. And to remember to be a giver, not a taker, which means you are going to help other people. Um, sometimes, you know, some, sometimes even though I was just a secretary, I helped another secretary and she maybe then did something to help me. And it's not just tit for tat, it's really partly, you're just, you take an attitude of generosity and you, you be careful about guarding your space or guarding your script so much that nobody ever gets to see your script because you're afraid someone's going to steal it yeah. um, or guarding yourself and just say, well, I don't want to raise up competition. You're going to have competition no matter what. You may as well become friends with your competition because in a way, any screenwriter you meet is your competition. And if, if you only have consider your competition's enemies, you don't have any friends. No. So um, just- I, I remember a certain over, cases you know? remember where, where writers were going up to people and asking them to sign non-disclosure agreements before you know they would, they would be graced to read their scripts. And obviously those careers didn't go very far. Um, and Carlos here has, has a question. So I, I do have a question. Oh, well, I can. I can. Yeah, sure. No, I'll just turn it around. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hello. Um, I had a question about um specifically the the genre. Yeah, specifically the genre of the romantic comedy. And like, there's mm -hmm. like, I feel like I've been seeing a lot of articles recently about like it's recent re in resurgence, or like people are trying to find like the next great rom com. Do you have any? uh like advice on like speci specifically for the genre of the rom-com things that pitfalls that you've noticed and like scripts that you've consulted and and things that you would recommend people to like either hone in on or avoid well i wish there were more of them because i'd love to be watching a lot of um romantic comedies right now and i find so few of them um first of all so many of them are not funny and secondly so many of them don't have heart I like a romantic comedy that has heart that there's something sweet and there's tender tender and I don't mean mushy I don't mean Pollyanna-ish but that there's you know if it's a romantic comedy there's supposed to be love and kindness and sweetness and I'd say don't be afraid to have some good characters. One of my favorite um, movies is As Good As It Gets. And one of my favorite characters, female characters is Carol. She is a good person. She doesn't take guff from anyone, but she's compassionate. She loves her son. She actually tries to be nice to this terrible Melvin. And, um, I, I think that people, I think one of the problems in so many scripts is that people are so much into their bad people, their evil, their conflict characters, that they don't create good people. And we go through life just, I'm sure in the class, there's a maybe 100% of you are good people. And so you say, well, what does it take to be a good person? Um, you know, kindness, support of people, uh, people that are emotionally sensitive to other people, people that say good things and kind things when you're down and that bore you up and give you good advice and are generous and are, um, you know, are find ways to be compassionate and um, 
just, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad thing to sit down sometime when you're ready to, before you write a script, make a, make a long list of what does it mean to be a good person. And to me, good people are more interesting than evil people. Evil people easily become one dimensional. That doesn't mean that you don't want to be dealing with people who have real conflicts and do bad things. That's part of what drama is about. But don't uh, bypass the good people and recognize all the nuances and start observing people that you really like and say, why do I like that person? And um, you know, don't don't feel like there has to be no goodness in your scripts is put something that draws us in. Uh, when I sit down for a minute and ask yourself, who are the characters in movies that I would like to meet? My list is really small. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think there's a lot of interesting characters that make me say I'd like to be friends with. I'd like to be friends with Carol and as good as it gets. There's a minor character in um, Philadelphia, the uh, one with Denzel Washington as his wife. I really like her. She She's maybe on screen five to 10 minutes, but uh, she's a good person and she doesn't take flack and she corrects her husband about, you know, you got a problem here to, deal with your your bias and your prejudice and maybe it's time you got over it and I think good for her I'll, I'll watch I'll watch as good as it gets tonight thank you that's I, it I, yeah is, is that that's all in Helen Hunt right Helen Hunt, Hunt Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson and James L. Brooks it's, uh, you haven't it's, seen it it's, I have yeah, no, I haven't. it's interesting you should yeah. say you would want to be friends with a Helen Hunt character because it's a very interesting character and she she doesn't say guff, she does speak her mind, but she does have a very fair and kind heart. And yes, uh, yes. Especially in conflict, Rocky Atlas with a uh, Jack Nicholson at his, his most unpleasant. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, any more questions in the room? Anyone else? Jason? Quick question. Yeah. Do you think AI can replace screenwriting? I knew that was coming. <laughs> Wait, say uh, say that again. Do you think AI can replace screenwriters? Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> I certainly hope not. It sounds like it would be something very derivative if they did. And besides, you know, I mean, I don't think people are going to be wiped off the map very soon. Population is still growing, so um no, I w wouldn't be too concerned about that. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Linda Seeger, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your for influencing so many generations of screenwriters. Thank you also for your insight and your kindness. So a very warm thank you from Yale. Yes, yes. Thank you all. Nice to be with you for this last period of time. Yeah.